Pastor Woodall, again, my friend, it is good for us to be here. Certainly, certainly. And uh, <clears throat> it's a blessing in First Baptist. Um, obviously, we're grateful to share this space with you all, to David's Temple, to all of our um, community and congregation that uh, engage with us online. We're grateful and appreciative uh, for all of you. Uh, Doc, I know you're headed out, getting on the bird tomorrow. <laughs> And so we pray, uh, pray, pray for that you have safe travels to and from Cali. I appreciate uh, your prayers, man, greatly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we hope that you're not out there rehearsing for next year's Super Bowl halftime show. <laughs> but uh, we trust that that the Lord will see you uh, to and from safely. Certainly, He'll see you safely through. So Certainly, we're grateful for that. I guess. You know, last week we got kind of sidetracked. Well, I wouldn't say sidetracked. It was relevant discussion. Like yeah. We had every intention uh, in talking about, um, you know, that, that passage in Exodus 4 at the end of the fourth chapter versus, I think, 27, 28, somewhere around there through the 31st verse. Right. And I think a lot of our discussion last week uh, sort of centered around all of the events that had transpired prior to Moses returning to, to Egypt yeah. and, to, and teaming up with Aaron yeah. and, and uh, having this meeting with the leadership, the elders there, yeah. um, and preparing them for what was to happen, right. what God was getting ready to do. Right. And so I think most of our discussion uh, centered around that, and we never really landed where we intended, but that, I think that's fine. I think that context is particularly important. I, I think it's impossible to understand the rest of Exodus 4 if we don't sort of take time and look at those larger narrative contours that are shaping the story and understand where where Moses is coming from and where Aaron are coming from. I think that that time we spent developing that context last week, I think is really important. Yeah. And so I think the discussion tonight um, is particularly relevant um, when it comes to Understanding, you know, how faith in the Old Testament was derived, yeah. especially within Israel. Yeah. And, and, and it's an example, I think, a paradigm and a, and a pattern that we see throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. Yes. You know, as absolutely. Jesus enters the scene and he begins his work. Good evening, everybody that's watching, uh, everybody that's tuning in online. Good evening. God bless you. Uh, we're so grateful to be here. Uh, be with you this evening. I see a few of our members from David's Temple joining. So God Certainly bless everybody. You. Good evening to you. Um, it's good to see you. We thank God for you. Again, our discussion tonight, Exodus 4, 27 through 31, we'll say. Um, that's really where we want to, to talk tonight. And again, you know, we're talking about Moses and Aaron having this meeting with the leadership. And, and you can read the text in just a second, but I'm just kind of trying to recap. Yeah. Um, where we were last week and how it relates to where we are this week, right? And we see this the faith being derived yeah. uh, for the entire nation yeah. through this meeting uh, that they're having with the elders right. in Israel. And there's some things that happen. There's a conversation that Moses has with God. There's some questions that Moses asks God specifically, yeah. some yeah. concerns that he raises. And yeah. we talked about last week. You know, it's a great lesson in leadership. Absolutely. And, and, and how we carry those and cast those cares sure. uh, to God when we're preparing, especially when it comes to faith. Good evening, Pastor Green, Pastor Antoine Green. Good evening. Pastor Green, good God to see you. you, man. Absolutely. We're honored to have you, man. And, and so I think to hurry through, this conversation, I think, is vitally important. Yeah. We're talking about how faith is derived within a community um, because this is not just a personal thing just between Moses and God, Aaron and God. It's a communal thing. This is Israel yeah. coming to faith in God yeah. and witnessing the salvation of the Lord, yeah. right? Yeah. And our community, yeah. We again, uh, I mean no harm, and I hope no one is offended by me saying, especially the black community, is in a desperate place yeah. when it comes to faith at yeah. this time. Yeah. And we need revival. Yeah. Uh, we need sort of this reintroduction. As Israel is being introduced to God, yeah. our community needs a reintroduction. Yeah. Yeah. to the God of our forefathers. A, a reintroduction to authentic faith, not uh, a cultural faith, mm -hmm. not a nominal faith, mm -hmm. uh, not even, I would say, merely a historical faith. Yeah. Certainly we need to come to know 
the God of our grandfathers and grandmothers, but not simply because he was the God of our grandfathers yeah. and grandmothers. We need to come to know him as our God, yeah. as our creator, as our sustainer, as our redeemer. Uh, so we need a point of re-engagement yeah. uh, with, with authentic faith in the context of the African-American community. I agree with you completely. Yeah. yeah. So, Doc, if you don't mind, read that text for us. And uh... I'm reading uh, Genesis 4. Exodus. Exodus 4. I'm sorry. Uh, that's what happens when you write too many papers about the Pentateuch in one week, Pastor Schultz. Uh Exodus chapter 4, beginning at verse 27. Uh, the Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he went and he met him at the mountain of God and kissed him. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord with which he had sent him to speak and all the signs that he had commanded him to do. Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the people of Israel. And Aaron spoke all the words that the Lord had spoke to Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people, and the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel, and that he had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshipped. Amen. You know, in, in looking at this text, again, I, I hate to keep going back, but Again, we see that like this is the defining moment yeah. for Israel when it comes to their faith and their relationship in God. Yeah. Right? This is this is the moment uh, Moses and Aaron have gathered these leaders together and they are sharing with the leadership yeah. what they have gotten from God. Yeah. And then the leadership yeah. will then go out and, 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 and share this good news yeah. uh, to the rest of, of the nation of Israel. Yeah. What is so ironic about this, mm -hmm. and, and, and our contemporary culture is sort of the antithesis of this moment, where we take um, from just a few sources, yeah. from a few elders, yeah. uh, we, we, we take what they say, and we take what we hear from them, yeah. and we believe that in faith. Yeah. Uh, today, everybody sort of wants to be able to come to their own conclusions, yeah. to build their own faith, yeah and to sort of derive and cultivate their own convictions. Yeah. Nobody wants to be told what to believe. Yeah. Nobody, nobody will really, and, and again, we talked about this last week, but, but we've come to a place to where um, it's almost instinct to uh, rebel against what our grandparents taught yeah. us. Yeah. Yeah. We don't want to do it the right. way they did it. We right. want to do it differently. Right. Uh, parenting. Yeah. Um, you know, what we wear, some of those things are valid, right? Sure. Times change. But sure. there's so many examples that we have in which our instinct or our reaction is to reject yeah. what is being passed to us yeah. from our elders sure. or someone in authority. Sure. And this is the opposite of what's going to happen um, to Israel in this moment. And and I guess I'm I'm wondering why. Like I want I want somebody to to help me with this and give me some some answers or, or or at least your assumptions as to why is it that we have this natural tendency to reject things that are passed down to us yeah. from our from our elders. I want to say this about the sort of shape of the text. This it, it really strikes me um, that that in the passage before us, God speaks to Moses. Moses speaks to Aaron. Mm -hmm. Moses and Aaron speak to the elders of the people. The elders of the people speak to the people. Yeah. And so the word of God, the, the word that will be a word of freedom, mm -hmm. the word that will be a word of liberation, the word that will be a word that affirms and confirms the fact that God has heard their groans mm -hmm. and has a redemptive plan for them comes from God mm -hmm. to the nominal leader. Yeah. Uh, to the person who God has assigned to serve in leadership, yeah. then to the elders who, who who serve an important function in the context of the community, yeah. then to the community. Yeah. There's a structure. And in our culture, it's an inversion of that structure, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, there is a suspicion mm -hmm. starting from the bottom up. It's, mm -hmm. it's almost a complete inversion. There's a suspicion of our culture and our tradition 
of its veracity, of its verifiability, of whether or not it has any relationship or connection to us and to our experience. You sort of go up or down, and we're talking about inversion. There's a suspicion yeah. of, of the people that have been called by God mm -hmm. to serve in our community and to, and to preach to us and teach to us and share uh, the gospel to us that is for our salvation. And then finally, there's a suspicion of God himself. Yeah. Uh, so in the pattern of the text, you see a community built around faith in the veracity and the reliability of the word of, of the word of God. And in our context, you see a community that's really been disassembled uh, because of suspicion of God's word, suspicion of God's people and suspicion of our people. That, that's a that's a striking kind of inversion I see in that text. I mean, you know, I agree completely. You, you've outlined this this inversion of what we see in the text and then what we see today. I do want to hear from our, you know, listeners, viewers, you know, however you are consuming this. What, what are your thoughts? Why is it that we, our natural reaction and our tendency is to reject anything that comes from the top? Yeah. Let's say. Uh, the we, top being our tradition. The top, top being the church. The top being the church. Yeah. The top yeah. being tradition. Yeah. The top being authority yeah. at, at large. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think it started out sort of as a secular trend because, you know, Honestly, we were against the institution. I think and, there's and the government. There's something in the marrow of America mm -hmm. that is suspicious mm -hmm. of concentrated authority, that is suspicious of tradition, mm -hmm. that is a suspicion of old codes and custom. I think there's something in the marrow of our people in our cultural history that because of how we've been treated by yeah. authority, yeah. because of how we've been treated and because our mistreatment and maltreatment have been codified into tradition, uh, I think there's something in us that has a natural unease <laughs> about it. It's in the marrow of America now. I think it's been in the marrow of America from the beginning. But, all right, we're talking here about faith and we're talking about this inclination to reject things sure. that come from the top. Sure. And that it's more, it's definitely, it may have existed always, but it's more of a thing now. Yes. Because let's think about faith 400, 500 years ago. Oh, sure, sure. African Americans. Sure, sure, sure. They got we're, their we're, faith from... Yeah. They they heard the gospel from yeah yeah and that's often the excuse that many people give. And speaking of excuses, there's a, there are a litany of excuses as to why you know I, I hear oftentimes that we shouldn't believe it's not intellectual enough. Sure, um, it's not consistent with having an ethic of equality, justice, caring about civil rights, and the liberation of our people. Right. Well, that it's yeah. so it's it's not consistent. It's yeah. not intellectual. Yeah. And if they've got to break some of this stuff down for people who watch to understand like what we mean by it not being intellectual enough. Because yeah. I'm guilty of this as well. Like, you know, we, we, we've talked about this before. Your parents will suggest something, um, suggest that you handle something a certain way or that you approach something a certain way or just without any real justification or explanation. Sure. Demand that you do this thing right. or you do not do this thing. Right. And because there, there is not a sufficient backing of this, sure. Explanation. we question it. Sure, sure. Only to find out later on down the road right. that what they were regardless saying. of what the explanation could have been, yeah. 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 that yeah. what they said was yeah. true. Right. It was fruitful. Right. You know, it right. was expedient for right. us. I think this is important. I, I want to say this and I, I want to continue on this line. I think it's part of our growth and development as people to engage in this kind of questioning, this, this kind of examination. I think a degree of that is healthy. I was talking with a member of our church on Sunday and she was sharing with me and, and, and I just lit up when she sh was talking with me about this. Her grandson has become increasingly inquisitive mm -hmm. uh, about natural phenomena in the world. Mm -hmm. So granny, why does God allow tornadoes to happen? Mm -hmm. Granny, why does God allow these things to happen? Granny, you, you pray to God. Mm -hmm. We have faith in God. We go to church. Why does God allow these, these, these misfortunate and tragic events to happen to us in our world? If, if God is love and if God is loving, right, yeah. uh, how, how and why? He, he's, he's, he's five. He's six. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And he's already wrestling with what theologians and scholars would call theodicy or the problem of evil. 
that's a good thing. Yeah. That, that's, that's fundamentally a good thing. That he's at the point where his intellectual life and his developing faith are beginning to have some interaction and some friction together. Mm. And he's beginning to ask those questions. How those questions are answered mm -hmm. in his personal life, as he's a member within the community of faith, in his family life, and in the world around him, will go on to shape how and if his faith develops. Yeah. So some degree of examination it's, it's is, is, is natural right. and necessary for growth. But I think that's, it, that's a different thing yeah. than what we're talking about. Yeah, no, so, so again, we're, we're talking about how we have these suspicions, yeah. right? And we, we have this natural uh, reaction to reject anything that comes from the top, anything yeah. that comes from our elders, anything that comes from the church, yeah. anything that comes sometimes from the Bible, yeah. like anything that, that is informed by our traditions, anything that's formed by our denomination. You know, we have a natural tendency. As we're talking about this, I think one of the reasons. Good evening, Brother Ayers, by the way. Good, good, good to see you, Brother Jeffrey Ayers, a uh, near and dear member, crown and the jewel of our church. Uh, one of the reasons I think that we have this, this suspicion and this cynicism is because believing in something, mm -hmm. it gives us a set of obligations. It gives us a set of responsibilities. Mm -hmm. It gives us a set of parameters in which to live our lives. If, if, if the people yeah. believe God, then they have to believe, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Israel, they have to believe that and they have to believe, let my people go so that they might go into the wilderness and serve me. So if, if they're going to believe God, they have to believe that he is both their liberator and the God of the universe who has a specific and divine design for them to live as his people and glorify them. They cannot just parcel out. They cannot just say, we'll take the liberation. We'll take the freedom from the Egyptians will take uh, your 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 mighty works that deliver us and extricate us from slavery, but we don't want the other part. So you're saying you're saying that the reason people have such a difficult time um, coming to faith in God is because it requires them to believe so many things at I, once. I, I, I'm saying that faith in God necessitates us to change our lives. And it is easier for us, materially easier for us to, to be in this liminal space of doubt and suspicion and anxiety. C.S. Lewis says in Mere Christianity, if God is who he says he is, if God's word is what he says it is, mm -hmm. then we have cause to be uneasy. If God is who he says he is, then who he is has real claims and impacts on our lives. We, we, we no longer get to, to be in the shadows of disconnection and apathy and, well, I don't know. Yeah. Once we admit. Well, I mean, so here's the, here's the thing. And, and I think this gets at what you're saying. And we, again, we got to, with our question. Sure. Why is it? that people have such a hard time accepting, believing one and accepting uh, or even conforming to things that come from the top. And I, and I want to, and I want to, for anybody who's just joining us, contextualize this in our text. In, in our text, the Lord speaks to Moses mm -hmm. concerning his plan mm -hmm. to deliver the Israelites. And Moses speaks to Aaron. Aaron, who's been assigned by God to work along with Moses and speak to the people and share with the people the plan that's going to effectuate their liberation. Moses and Aaron speak with the elders and share the plan of God for liberation and deliverance from slavery. Mm -hmm. The elders speak with the people. And in every level of that, there is belief and faith and commitment to what God says. We compared that and contrasted that to our contemporary context where there's suspicion. Mm -hmm. There's suspicion about what God, who God is. There's suspicion about what God has said and whether or not it can believe, mm -hmm. be believed. There's suspicion about uh, the people who God has called them to preach to us, to teach to us, 
uh, and our elders, our both historical and contemporary, mm -hmm. uh, who have lived lives of faith before us. And so there's a distinction, and, and we're exploring what the nature of that, that distinction is. Yeah, so when we think about this, you know, when, 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 when we're told to do something, good evening, good evening, everyone that's, that's joining, when we're told to do something, you know, you know, we talked about it's healthy sometimes to ask some questions. Sure. Um, but but much of faith, well, not much of faith. Hebrews tells us that faith, faith is. Is. Yeah. 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 Um, and, and we got the only thing we have to lean on sometimes is not what we see. Right. It's, it's not substance that we have. And, and this is here we are getting to, I think, the distinction between what God has called us to. But, but, but before we go there, go let, let's like let's give some tangible examples okay. of the type of rejection we're talking about. So um, when. You know, when, when your parents say do this without any justification, sure. sometimes we say we, we question it because there's not an, enough intellectual evidence sure. to suggest that this thing is the best thing for us to do. Or, or when when the pastor says, hey, the Bible says, forsake ye not the assembly of your shows together. This means that you should come to church on Sunday. Right. Um, we have a hard time, like, accepting things that come from the top. Yeah. And we will fight, scratch, tooth and nail to, to just come up and conjure reasons that this is not something that is the best for us or something that we should believe or something that we should do. Right. Um, when, when, when our traditions, when our church traditions, the church, Big C, traditions uh, tell us, you know, that, that, that there are certain things uh, such as being a part of community. Not only the Bible tells us that we should forsake not the assembly, but history tells us yeah. that you grow. As yeah. a believer within the church, within the church, yeah, you know, not being a lone wolf, right? Um, you know, not not feeling like you can just read your Bible and, and cultivate deeper faith and become uh, a more mature disciple on your own. But when history tells us yeah. that without a community of believers, um, you will stumble, you will fall, yeah. you will not grow, you will be malnourished, yeah. all of those things, and yet and still we reject or we question the idea. Here, of how necessary is it? For we are Bible? we are caught existentially mm -hmm. between what scripture says, what the community of faith embodies and personifies and what the world and the culture tells us. Mm -hmm. So culture says, I'm the master of my fate. Yeah. Culture says I can be in charge of my own spiritual growth and my own spiritual development. Culture says uh, that I can manage my own spiritual life without the edification that comes from being in the context of a Christian community that I can tell mm -hmm. within myself that I have the capacity to tell when I'm wrong and where I'm wrong and the capacity to correct my course all within myself. Culture says that I'm self-sufficient, but scripture says yeah. we need the Christian community. Yeah. The, the, the tradition of our Christian community affirms that it is better for us to come together, to strengthen each other, to encourage each other, to build together and, than it is for us to be alone. And this speaks to the plague of a postmodern age. Sure. When everybody has their own truth, right? Right. And so everybody gets to determine what's expedient for them, what's best for them, despite the evidence, yeah. despite the facts, and despite scripture, yeah. we get to say, well, I don't want to do it that way. And, and this is where we, we have to draw the line that scripture draws and say, there is no such thing as my truth. Right. If, if you are living your truth, right. you are living in accordance with scripture, a lie. A lie. <laughs> <laughs> there is only the truth right you know yeah. jesus is not a way yeah he is the way right. and so you know when, when we when we think about this uh sometimes the difficulty that it is and our struggle here is how do we reintroduce our communities to faith in god how do we reintroduce our communities to god obviously when we look around on sundays and we see um the pews empty or, or we just look around our world. We, we watch the news and we read some of the headlines. It's abundantly clear that what what America has, what the African-American community has is a faith problem. Yeah. 
um, we have sort of devalued the faith of our, our ancestors. Uh, and, and, and again, we keep going back to this, but a lot of times it's simply because we feel that everything that is old, yeah. right, is just outdated I, and I it's saw this, uh, obsolete. And I, so it's no longer relevant. I saw this great sort of decorative sign hanging in a, in a restaurant and it was almost a, kind of a riddle for me. And I just fixed my mind around it for the rest of the day. It said, my grandmother used it. Mm -hmm. My mother threw it out mm -hmm. and I bought it back mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. And it was like a Sphinx sort of riddle to me. Yeah. I was trying to spend all day figuring out what those three words, mm -hmm. those three phrases together were in reference to. Mm -hmm. And I did. Mm -hmm. And it was about antiques. Yeah. Right? My grandmother, my grandmother used it. My mother threw it out and I bought it back. Mm -hmm. Right? And I think when we look at our history and our heritage, I think we're in something that's similar in, 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 a, in a cyclical way. Not really when okay. it comes to faith. Because okay. I, our when grandparents it, okay. believed yeah. the church was strong, the church was healthy. That's my point. Our, our, my grandmother, my grandfather used it. To them, mm -hmm. faith, Christian community, Scripture, mm -hmm. a relationship with God is important. Mm -hmm. At some point, at some place, mm -hmm. it was thrown away. Yeah. And now we're put in the position now of trying to recover it. That's what I mean. That's, I, I still don't think that's a one-to-one. -one. Okay. Because when you, when you talk about antiques um, and the way the world is worked, like in everything else in the world, yeah. you always see things go full circle. The things that were thrown away, uh, well, the things that were, were hip 40 years ago, right? Um, our grandparents. Yeah. Our parents said, "Oh, we don't like that." Right. They threw it out. Right. We come we come around. Right. And we go to the to the boutique. Sure. To the thrift to, store. To the thrift store. Right. We go searching for the vinyl records. Right. Right. Our, our, like that's a whole thing again. Yeah. And vinyl records are super expensive. Right. And like people are just like really into the quality of, of vinyl sound sure. because they rediscovered or discovered rather. Sure. This generation has discovered the richness sure. that the elder generation sure. enjoyed. Sure. But that generation in the middle right. said that this is obsolete. Right. Why would I want a vinyl right. when I can have How is this not a, a one? How why, would I, why would I want a vinyl yeah. when I can have a portable CD player, sure. MP3? Sure. But now there's a whole generation that says, but you're missing out on the richness of the vinyl. Okay. That's different from when we talk about the church okay. because nobody is now saying, I'm missing out I on see. what my grandparents I see. had. I see. You know, that generation before, we saw this decline initiate, yeah. right? Where you know, a lot of it was because, well, the church is too old, the church is too outdated, the church isn't keeping up with the world. Why would we go to church? It feels like we're stepping back 30 years in time. Sure. And so they said, uh uh, you know, we don't need that. How, how, how relevant or how valuable can a faith that's 40 years old be to us today? Sure. And and we still have not reached that point where we sort of reclaim culturally. Yeah, we are not seeking it in the same way. Yeah, spiritually though, yeah. it is crucially important to us it is. that we recover it. It is. We, yeah, and I mean we know that. Sure. I mean believers. And, know and I that. think and I think the charge of the church now mm -hmm. is connecting that truth that. Christian community needs to be recovered and uncovered. Faith in God. Faith in God. Yeah. 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 As it is expressed in the context of Christian community, yeah. needs to be uncovered and recovered yeah. and reconnected yeah. to the culture. Let's do this comment. We just got a really great comment. Um, and it says, and now it seems like it's hard for people to accept words from our elders. We take words as being judgmental. And sometimes words can be given wrong and or taken wrong. And there's a lack of understanding and communication between us and our elders now. Yeah. I think it's a great comment. And, and I, I think Absolutely. What it, what it does, Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, what it does is it, it, it kind of shows us that there are two sides of this coin, to this problem. There's two sides of this coin. Sure. But it does not um, devalue the need for us to still endeavor to communicate that faith. And so... Here are some problems like, okay, so, so let's talk about this. Uh, now, we're talking about Moses and Aaron going to the elders, the elders then going to Israel, and then we see Israel as a nation become God's people. Before we get there, though, I think this is important. 
again, we talked about this a little bit last Let's week. Let's make sure we deal with this comment, though. I, absolutely. Yeah. But I, I want to say this about the text, and, and I think it relates to the comment. God gives them signs mm -hmm. to show the people mm -hmm. so that they might be convinced. Mm -hmm. they, the elders. They show the elders. God gives Moses, Moses the power to perform these signs. Absolutely. So that if the elders question right. the veracity of his claims, they'll be convinced. They will be convinced. Right. Correct. Moses, they, they, Moses and Aaron, they work these signs mm -hmm. and the people are convinced. Mm -hmm. and, and, and here's the relationship between that reality in our text to, that, to this question. Something has to happen in the life of our elders to convict us and convince us in our own Christian walk. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times when advice and counsel is given, people lose sight of that chapter in their life mm -hmm. where they needed to be convinced and convicted also. Mm -hmm. People lose sensitivity to the reality that at a certain point in their life, they were reluctant to hear and heed wisdom also. And I think that kind of sensitivity and, and, and a connection to that reality, I think is really, really important. There is a fine line between expressing concern and being condescending. Yeah. That fine line is compassion. Yes. We see Moses with that compassion for his people. Right. And that sort of, that, that compassion is what mo motivates and fuels and influences our communication. When we talk to people. It should. Who are, should. Yes. When we talk to people who are obviously lost, right? Who right. are struggling, who right. are seeking, who right. are trying to find their way, who may even be, you know, trying to understand faith and, and maybe coming to faith, I think that we have to ensure that all of our words are seasoned with salt, seasoned yeah. with grace, and yeah. that we have that compassion. Yeah. Because as God communicated to Moses, let's think about this big picture. When we talk to someone, uh, and, and we've discussed this issue at length of trying to reintroduce our communities to God, yeah. you know, to reintroduce our communities to the faith that our grandparents found value in. Yeah. It has to be fueled by com compassion and a great concern for their salvation. Yeah. This is what God, this is how God communicates to us. I've heard this is why God groan. communicating the most. We yeah. go back to chapter three. I've yeah. heard that groans. Yes. Yeah. I've heard that groans yeah. and crying and prayer. I've, I've been I've been affected. Yeah. I've been moved. And there is there is the compassion. Yeah. And so I think uh what what we need really to to help and to and when it comes to evangelism, when it comes to community, uh we need to to make sure that we are understand and I think collectively the compassion that's required and i think there's compassion in both dimensions mm -hmm. right uh i'll never forget pastor mh parker who's moved upstairs now and i've probably mentioned this before uh he's a pastor at good ship uh missionary baptist church down in the Wetumpka area and when i was going to school in, in montgomery at huntingdon he was particularly kind to me and i remember calling him one evening just to tell him thank you for how kind he had been to me and taking my phone calls and encouraging me. And I told him, frankly, I said, you know, in my experience, not all older pastors are so kind to younger preachers. Yeah. And what he told me, I will never forget. Mm -hmm. He said, it's because we forget. Mm -hmm. You've got to be a young preacher Amen. before you get to be an old preacher. Amen. And I think that compassion is needed. Mm -hmm both on the side of the person sharing mm -hmm. and on the side of the person listening. Right. Compassion and sensitivity to the situation of the person that you're sharing with right. and compassion that, uh, that actually listens right. as opposed to just waits for humility. the other person. I mean, that, yeah. that, that, that's humility, right? Um, and so, and I want to get to this comment by Brother Ayers, but the, the compassion is needed. Again, we start with, if we're genuinely concerned, if we're genuinely concerned. If you're going to go to somebody and tell them that, hey, you shouldn't do this or, hey, you need to do this or, or need to do this. Number one, have compassion. Let, let those words be fueled by a sincere and genuine concern, yeah. not your personal interest. And if you can't find that tone, right. pray, pray until you can get it right. But, but even before that, yeah. make sure that you're going to this brother or to this sister 
is not fueled by your personal interest or just your personal preference. Yeah. Make sure that your concern is grounded and rooted in some salvific, redemptive, yeah. or biblical yeah. concern yeah. or issue. Yeah. And if you have no biblical justification yeah. for what you're about to communicate to yeah. this person, yeah. keep it to yourself. Moreover, you should pray that the Lord would change you. Because th your compassion <laughs> shows up in this, right? It, and it says that, Lord, I don't like this. Yeah. I don't agree with this. Yeah. I can't find anywhere where you disagree yeah. with it. Yeah. And I so, think. So help me in, in this regard. That's important, too, right? We have to examine the nature of our conversations with our brothers and sisters on the basis of God's word. And if we don't know what the word says about it, yeah. we don't have sufficient footing and grounding to really be meaningfully uh, helpful and engaged. I was wrong. I was wrong. I was wrong. I, I won't say don't say anything at all. I would say exercise even more humility and compassion. <laughs> I would say I'm because sorry. sometimes because sometimes we do know what is right. Sure. But we can't quote verse. You know, no, yeah. And, I, and what, I, what I'm saying is I'm not saying unless you can quote chapter or verse. Yeah. Be silent. Yeah. But I'm saying, unless there is a sufficient basis for yeah. what you're saying yeah. in the word of God, I, I am convinced, man, that, and, and, and here we come to Brother Ayers' comment, that so many people have been hurt and harmed mm -hmm. and had their spiritual growth and development hampered in our churches mm -hmm. by Christians who might have meant well. They meant well. Most of, most of them mean well. But were overzealous and unprepared mm -hmm. to have those kinds of conversations. Yeah. And they were turned away yeah. and they were discouraged. Yeah. And so now we look up into the reality that Brother Ayers was just discussing. You know, Let's read that comment. So Brother Ayers says, just had a conversation about traditional denominational, traditional denominational versus non-denominational in today's worship and how black churches are dying. Yeah. Um, First and foremost, brother, S, thank you for this comment. And this, like, this is so much richer when we have engagement. Absolutely. Now, I, I mean, I realize we can come up with a lot of words and say a lot of things, but if our words aren't connecting to yeah. people and helping people to grow and to and to, and to understand the word, then um, we're just saying a lot of stuff. So I'm I'm thankful uh, when you guys comment and Absolutely. ask questions and provide context and share your experience because uh, that that helps us. Uh, in this exercise, but it is true. Yeah, black churches are dying. Yeah, uh, it is true that traditional black churches are dying faster. Yeah. than non-traditional and non-denominational churches. Yeah, yeah. Uh, why is that? I think it's for a lot of reasons. Uh, something that broke my heart was a conversation I had with someone a couple of years ago, who shared with me that her and her father were supposed to get baptized but that no one explained to her what baptism was about. Mm. Had another conversation with a dear friend of mine, and we were just going through kind of casually the order of service uh, in the historical, traditional African-American you know, Baptist church. Mm. And he said, you know, I don't know why we do yeah. most of this stuff. I don't know what devotion is about. Yeah. I don't know what responsive reading is about. I don't know why those announcements are important and what relationship they have to our heritage and our context. Uh, I don't know why there's so many prayers. I don't know why there's so many songs. Yeah. I don't know what relationship, uh, what relationship we're doing has to scripture. Yeah. And I think that when the lines are unclear mm -hmm. uh, between what any denomination, historical or contemporary, is doing, when the lines are unclear between what they're doing and what scripture says the church ought to be doing, mm -hmm. uh, then the world, the culture, the context around it are going to ask, what value does this have? And so I think part of the reason that uh, historic African-American churches are struggling uh, is because historically speaking, I think we took it for granted that they knew the story. Yeah. We took it for granted that they knew why we wore black and white on first Sunday mm -hmm. and had the Lord's why Prayer. Why knew we wore black and white? It's a it's a solemn reflection of what the what the table is about, what communion. Why is why about. we put, why do we drink white linen over the table? <laughs> because we're we're celebrating. No 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 no! Don't even go there. <laughs> it's because back in the day uh, they wanted to keep the flies 
off the bed. Well, so, so there's a there's a cultural and there's a theological explanation, right? Okay. I mean, I think there's so, a cultural I, and theological explanation for the white gloves I, I, and the one I, hand behind your back I think too. Sometimes yeah. it's like high school football. Uh -huh. Like the longer we are departed from something, uh -huh. the more we romanticize it, I, and so we I construct think, theology to sure. kind of make it make sense. But I don't know if that necessarily was the plan. I, I think that there is a holy and sacred solemnness. You think that? Yeah, but when they started, were they thinking that when they started? Doing well, that? that I'll never know. But okay. but oh, so, but, so, that, so but that's the relationship is, between case and point, though. But this is what I'm saying. I, there's a clear relationship mm -hmm. between the solemnity of the Lord's Supper in Scripture, true, and I'm not, and what you're describing not, with the linen tablecloth. I'm, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with that. Okay, but like I said, if that was not the original intent, it's easy for us to romanticize. Oh, sure. Right. Sure. And so it sounds good for you to say that. Sure. But is that really fruitful? Is it fruit? Because then what happens is you build in this culture that will reprimand someone for not doing I it. I think it depends. It depends on whether or not we're it depends on whether or not we're educating and pointing to scripture. It depends on what the basis of our doing it is. Uh -oh. If the basis of our doing it is because we've always done it, that's unhealthy. If the basis of our doing it has a root system in scripture and we can prove consistencies and patterns in relation to scripture, this, that's different. Go ahead. But, okay. Let me ask this question to, to those who are, who are tuning in. What is something that we do in the church, uh, any church, black church, whatever church you go to, uh, what is something that we do in the church that you just don't understand why we do it or why it started? I'm, oh, I'm, this is I'm interested <laughs> in hearing. I want to see the list. I don't of know why your sermons are so long. <laughs> I don't know why all your points have to rhyme. <laughs> Uh, but, but I don't know why it, we I, always have to sing Amazing Grace on this day. <laughs> I don't know why we don't know the second verse to lift every voice and sing. But listen, uh, <laughs> it's, help, it's helpful for the church, though, to know these things because people who are coming into the church, we got to understand where they are. Sure. If they don't understand any of this, doesn't mean we have to stop doing it. Sure. It means that we need to be cautious and we need to make sure we educate. And I agree. Inform. I agree. And when we and when we exempt back to the to the question that you asked, right, I think the. I agree with you mm -hmm. that the road mm -hmm. has grown too long mm -hmm. between why we're doing certain things, right? Mm -hmm. And the relationship between I, those things and scripture. I gotta go back to your white linen comment. Uh, I mean, <laughs> you came up with that sounds good. I didn't come up with that. <laughs> Where, where'd you get that from? <laughs> I mean, that I, I, the senior pastors told me that when I was coming along and I was being trained about the solemnity of the Lord's Supper, it's it's Again, the body and the blood that are that are covered. It, okay, follow me. Okay, those things are true. Okay, it's a very serious moment. Yeah, I mean we're called to reflect. Sure, it's a solemn occasion. Sure, um, it's it's somewhat celebratory, but but this is an ordinance that was ordained by yeah. Christ within the church. Yeah. you know the yeah. Holy Communion. Yeah, now we have this white cloth. That we drape over sure. the communion table. Sure. You're just giving this this beautiful. And I want to say, and I want you to finish. But I don't. I don't think it's a matter of like salvation. I don't think that when when the last trumpet sounds, they're gonna ask. They're gonna ask what the white linen, the white linen oh. was about. <laughs> no, but I'm saying this is a this is this is case in point, right? Like, and, and it's 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 theology. It's the church. It's whatever. It's COVID. It's whatever. Right. We will sometimes. Create justification. Sure. And it may be something that is true biblically. Sure. But it may also be disconnected from the origin sure. of the thing. Sure. So what you said about this being a solemn moment, true. Right. Won't disagree. Right. But when we talk about the origins, right. that may not be, they may, the, when, when the church started draping the white linen over the communion table, sure. that may not have been in, on anybody's mind. Sure. I mean, you've heard that story about the mom and the, ha and the ham. Mm -hmm. the, the daughter asked the mom, uh, why do you always cut your ham in half? Mm -hmm. And she said, because my mom did it. Mm -hmm. So she asked her grandma, why do you always cut the ham in half? And she said, because my mom did it. And she asked her great grandma, why did you always cut the ham in half? And she said, my pot was too small. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and so don't get me wrong. Yeah. There, there are a great deal of traditions and codes and customs in the context of the historical African-American church that are just that, they are devoid, they are divorced, divorced from scripture. They have no real theological tethering. Mm -hmm. I don't know if the cloth over the Lord's Supper is one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we have a comment here. 
uh, Ms. Perry McDonald says, I think that a lot of the reason that the black churches are dying is because we stopped t- teaching what our tradition. I mean, this is this is going back to the point. Yeah. Like, let's ask these questions. Sure. And I and I think these questions are important. Yeah. You know, I, I think one but, of the. But here's the issue, though. Go ahead. Too often times we get offended. Oh, I agree. With some of the questions. I agree. And, and, I, and this goes back. This goes back to an earlier comment about like how we approach conversations with people sure, who may not understand. Sure, sure. We gotta exercise humility because we gotta. We got. We may be convicted that this is what we should do. This is right. This is the thing to do. Yeah. And we may be right. Right. But if we cannot feel the question. Yeah. And articulate why. Yeah. Then we may need to with we sensitivity need to, and humility and we, compassion. We, we may need to cool a little bit yeah, yeah. on our conviction. Yeah. We can still believe it, yeah. but we should not reprimand people or be so stern sure. uh, just because if our only justification is because this is how we do it. I think and and that is particularly where mm-hmm. when we talk about the the regression mm-hmm. and the disparate state mm-hmm. of the historic African American church, I think that's it in a nutshell. I mean, so the conversation we're having about draping the white lens, Miss Pam McDonald says, if we should ask an older mother of the church, um, it may be because white cloth uh, represents purity. Again, sure, that could be, that could be it. Sure. Or, or to your point, that may not have been the, the original intent. Sure, but it sounds like a valid thing. Sure, right. Sure. The only way we would know would be to go back. Right. Way back. Right. To its inception. Well, and, Does, and the, to, oh, let me ask ahead, question. Does the Bible say that we need to drape no, a white lady? But, but Paul reprimands a young church mm-hmm. for a lack mm-hmm. of seriousness Correct. and solemnity Correct. when it comes Correct. to the Lord's Supper. Yeah. He, he reprimands them for not taking it seriously. Yeah. And he recenters our salvation around the salvific act of the body and the blood. Yeah. And so he, he affirms and he teaches and he corrects and reproves on the basis of them not taking it seriously enough. Yeah. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I hope nobody misunderstands me. I'm not saying that next time have we have communion. You're going to have to give it a count for yeah, that. No, I'm not, no, 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 no. I'm not <laughs> suggesting that I'm against <laughs> draping the table in white. I lines. don't know, man. I'm, I'm, not <laughs> say, I'm not saying that at all. I'm, I'm so don't. I don't want it to get. I don't want it to be out on me <laughs> that he don't believe. You, you don't believe in the no. Uh, uh, but but what, what I'm saying is is just let's ask the question. Let's understand. I I agree. And, I agree and, with you completely and, that we have missed. Yeah some opportunities for meaningful conversation. I remember one time in revival, I don't know, I don't know if you guys did this when uh you you uh you were coming up, but in revival, we always do we, we would always have on program this thing called the uh man, I can't even think of what it's called now. So the preacher, a preacher would get up before the preacher um got up during revival to preach. And the appeal, the revival yeah. appeal. Yeah. Did you guys do the appeal? Have an appeal? We we didn't call it an appeal. Mm-hmm. We we did the invitation to discipleship. I saw some mourners bench mourners activity bench. Well, as okay. well. So this is how I went. You have you know devotion, read the scripture. There will be the revival appeal, mm-hmm. the sermon, and then the invitation to Christian discipleship. Yeah. And so the the, the appeal was almost it. Kind of always ended up being like the warm up sermon, sure. like somebody would sneak a sermon in. Sure, sure. Um, but a few times I heard guys sort of, um, you know, t- genuinely give an appeal and, and ask those who are in the congregation to, 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 to prepare their hearts, prepare their minds to hear the gospel, yeah. and to already be thinking about making a decision to follow Jesus yeah. after the gospel is preached. Yeah. And I think that's a pretty good, absolutely. Pretty good approach to an, value, an appeal. Yeah. Yeah. It could be a valuable part of yeah. any sermon because yeah. ultimately in that's some what we traditions do. they would call that exhortation. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, ultimately that's what we want to do is yeah. encourage en- encourage people toward belief and faith sure. in Jesus Christ. Sure. But I remember asking uh, an older pastor right. in the study one time before revival. He says, "Would you do the appeal?" I said, "Sure, I'll do it." I said, um, "But." Can you tell me what the appeal is supposed to be about? Like, what is the appeal? Like, why do we do it? When did it start? He's like, right. I don't know. Right. <laughs> you know? Right. So, I mean, it's so 
to ask that question is to not necessarily say that I'm against something. Sure. At all. No, we have to be able to ask and answer mm -hmm. those questions. Mm -hmm. I think we have to understand that our failing mm -hmm. to answer those questions mm -hmm. with compassion, mm -hmm. our failing to engage in the questions that people have about why the church do mm -hmm. what it does. Mm -hmm. I think our failure to do that is, is part of the reason we've come to this this place yeah. where we're disconnected from our community, where we're disconnected from the existential challenge that people are facing. Mm -hmm. And if we're not able to engage in a conversation around why we lay a white linen tablecloth over the communion table, how effectively are we going to share the gospel? Because and then, and then this is what happens. This is the consequence. Right. Over the course of the next 30, 25, 30 years, you have another generation come up. And you've basically been pounding home yeah. this tradition. Yeah. Uh, whatever it is. Yeah. We're off the white. Not, we're, and, off the, we're off the white. And limit. I want to say this. Not truth. Yeah. Not not conviction. Yeah. Not salvation. Yeah. But tradition. Just tradition. And 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 Jesus takes issue yeah. with the people who have taught right. vain tradition mm -hmm. in place. Mm -hmm. of doctrine, mm -hmm. who have exalted what he calls the tradition of the elders mm -hmm. over doctrinal truths that are affirmed in scripture. That, that, that is error. Yeah. And, and, and not only that, uh, you run the risk of disconnecting people as if we, as if we need help in that area. Sure. You run the risk of disconnecting people from the church because what you then do is propagate uh, some tradition or some belief that then causes those who are young or new to the faith or whatever uh, to have questions that cannot be reconciled. Right, right? right. And then they start to question the value of the church sure. at large sure. in itself. Sure. And, and this is not only the church. I mean, we see this uh, in our lives culturally. Right. There are things and approaches, whether it be to cooking or whether it be to housekeeping, sure. uh, that our grandparents strongly believed in pine saw. All I mean, sure. a lot of things. I strongly believe yeah, in pine you saw. Believe too. in that. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> and it's not to say that what they're doing was harmful. Sure. But maybe they had some extra things in there that weren't really necessary. Sure. And and it and it made it a it 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 raised that barrier to entry just sure, a little bit. Sure, and sure. it discouraged many people from sure. even partaking in the practice sure. and I, of and I cooking think, a meal and, and, and all that because they thought it was like, what you mean, I got to do all of this? What you're describing, again, is a lack of or a lapse in mm -hmm. sensitivity. Mm -hmm. What if, just what if, someone wasn't raised in the church? Mm -hmm. What if they've never heard the church covenant? What if they don't know all the verses to Amazing Grace? What if somehow, some way that they slipped through the cracks and they and they were never in Sunday school mm. or they were never in BTU or they never they never came to vacation Bible school mm. and they never heard the gospel. Mm -hmm. And no one ever told them that Jesus was the son of God mm -hmm. who died for our sins and was resurrected mm -hmm. and, and now sits at the right hand of the father making intercession for us. What if that's their reality? And if there is no sensitivity to the possibility that that might be the reality of someone who walks in our church on Sunday, mm -hmm. we're really failing to effectively be a Christian community. Yeah, I mean, it, it, like, and like I said, I, I think what, what we don't want to do is allow our traditions to um, cause, raise the barrier of entry. Yeah. And, and, and raise that so high. Yeah that someone who is coming without any experience to the church yeah. feels so overwhelmed yeah. by our traditions and I wanna, and that I they wanna, can't be connected to God. And I want to make a turn here. But, but, hold on, but, but, so, but just to relate that culture, I, I, as I was saying, think about some of the cooking methods that our grandparents subscribed to. Sure. Right? Yeah. Uh, think about, I mean, they've worked hard in the kitchen. They've, and some of it was because they believed some things about food science and food and sanitation sure. that it, it didn't hurt anybody. I mean, sure. they were they were literally doing and acting according to what they thought was, was best. Some of it came for from their... They were serving. Some right? of it came from their sort of sociological background, their access to certain ingredients. Right. And, and, so and the lack of technology sure. at that time. Sure. And so they believe that this is how we do this. Yeah. Right? But as we progressed, some this of those is how practices, we do this. Became this is the only way to do yeah. it. 
And as we progressed in all reality, scientifically, none of those things were proven to be true. None of those original reasons were proven to be true. Yet we still say that that you have to do them. right? And so you think about over time how um, we learn things and, and we grow and we understand that maybe all of that wasn't really necessary. Sure. And, and then you think about how many people, how many more people would have committed to the church had they not been turned away and not been by something yeah, that isn't that wasn't necessary. required. Yeah. You yeah, know? Yeah. And, and so I guess to go back to, to be fair, I'm not an anti-traditionalist at all. I do believe in asking questions. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and we I, should. And, and, I've, and I ask questions because I want to be sensitive to those who yeah. you mentioned yeah. who don't have that background. And, in and, and, and again, if we have no sensitivity and if there is no point of entry into the Christian conversation, much less Christian community, mm-hmm. but if there's no point of entry into the Christian conversation mm-hmm. uh, for people who have no context, no background, no biblical literacy, yeah. Uh, then we're we're failing to be faithful disciples. Yeah. I, I want to say this and 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 make a turn. There is mm-hmm. such a thing as good tradition. Oh, definitely. Um, we, yeah. We're not saying yeah. you or me yeah. um, that everything old needs to be jettisoned. Yeah. And, and um, I strongly believe that you do that. Tradition provides you. An infrastructure yeah. that will help you yeah. consistently, you know, do the things that you're supposed to do. Yeah. I strongly believe. I, I strongly believe in the the testimony yeah. of God me over great Jehovah. Yeah. I, I see the the interconnectedness mm. between the lyrics in that song mm-hmm. and the situations of the generations of black folk mm-hmm. who sang them as they were trying to square their existential situation Mm -hmm. with their heavenly home. Mm -hmm. I I believe in the value of of those songs and those hymns. And and I believe in how the story Mm -hmm. that comes down to us from them when they gathered together in those churches that weren't comfortable, that didn't have all of our modern amenities now and sang those old songs that they weren't just singing lyrics, but they were they were articulating their their stories. Mm-hmm. That I am a pilgrim in this barren land. I am weak, yeah. and I realize that you are mighty, and I realize my need for you. Yeah, a lot of you know a lot of traditional hymns have do have theological value. Oh, immense and theological so, value. And so I think that you know some of those things are important. Again, I think it, when it comes to in the case of hymns versus the contemporary church, right? sure. Um, I, I think that they have theological value, but I, I do not think that if you don't know the words to God, me over great Jehovah, or you don't, can't connect to that, I don't think it'll keep you out of heaven. Oh, no, absolutely not. I, I, what um, I'm saying is, I think the, this is in the context of me saying that there's such a thing as good tradition. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. For some people, mm-hmm. those, those hymns and those standards and that way of singing has no resonance. Yeah. And if you like hearing everything to me, mm. as opposed to a charge to keep I have, mm. we can worship together. <laughs> you know, yeah. we can celebrate the, the beauty of, of, of scripture and the joy of salvation together. If if you prefer to hear uh, Mary, Mary, mm-hmm. as opposed to, oh, Mary, don't you weep? Mm-hmm. Uh, that's OK. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. that's a, that's a matter of sensibility mm-hmm. as opposed to, you know, the, the issue of truth. And, you know, we've mentioned that there, there is requires some humility on both sides of this, whether you agree with the tradition, traditions or you disagree with the traditions. I think that we also need to be sensitive and understand that uh, they know there may not be we may not be able to quote chapter verse yeah. uh, as to why to get yeah. justification for why we do this. But I think what we what we have to understand that theology and tradition are. Uh, are our way yeah. of trying to understand yeah. how we can hold on to this thing called faith yeah. um, in the midst of our contemporary whatever it is. Yeah. So the way we pray, the yeah. way we sing, yeah. the way we gather was all done for a reason. Yeah. And those 
circumstances then yeah. have to be considered or understood in order to understand why we did things the way we did them. Sure. Just just like now, we want to change things, we want to do things different, and we we try to say that the world is different, our circumstances are different, things are different, and so why can't we just do it this way? Well, I mean, we got to use that same reasoning when we think about tradition, and so I don't think traditions are evil. I don't yeah. think traditions are bad. Yeah. Yeah. I think, again, we need to have a balanced approach and I think I think they have to be our traditions and our changes. And I agree with you need to be rooted in truth. Yeah. Yeah. As opposed to this. We take this truth or contemporary. and we figure out how yeah. we can conform and we can construct our lives together in the church, our, our individual lives yeah. in order to support this truth. Right. I think that's what it is. So yeah. to affirm, to share, to, share. to so, amplify. So going this back truth. to the white. The white linen thing. <laughs> um, even if the original cause uh -huh. was not as you proposed, sure. you still propose justification, solid justification, and saying that, well, when we partake in Holy Communion together, it's a solemn moment. And oftentimes we do use a white sheet, white linen, and, yeah. and we do use black and white to, to symbolize a signal of funerals, symbolize yeah. um, solemn moments in yeah. our lives. Yeah. And so this approach helps those who are uh, preparing to partake to understand the sure. seriousness sure. and the reverence sure. that is required. And even if, to be fair, what you proposed yeah. in saying that the function of the white linen tablecloth was to keep the flies off, that signals mm -hmm. that the bread mm -hmm. and the cup are important. Mm -hmm. Or you just want to clean. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, or just you want to be sanitary. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean so I tried I, to let you off the hook. <laughs> you heard it, David Temple. I tried to let him off the hook. I tried. I did my very best. So, you know, I mean, regardless, I don't think traditions are necessarily the problem. No. It's how we inform, it's yeah. how we educate, it's yeah. how we deal, it's how because we consider it won't change, be... it's how we do all of those are the issues. The traditions themselves are not the issues yeah. because none of these things were created by ill intent and, and none of the traditions that we have in church are created to pull us away from biblical truth. Yeah. Most of them, I mean, are not. I yeah. mean, I think we, when, when any of those things started, people were doing the best they could yeah. according to what they knew. What's at the heart of our passage? isn't the fact that the elders mm -hmm. shared the tradition. Mm -hmm. It isn't the fact that Moses and Aaron told the elders. It was at the heart of our passage is that God spoke. Yeah, yeah. God heard yeah. their groans, mm -hmm. their cries, mm -hmm. their agony, their anguish, mm -hmm. and set in motion a redemptive plan to effectuate their liberation from slavery. Mm -hmm. If God doesn't speak, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if Aaron and Moses talk. Yeah. It doesn't matter what the elders tell the people. Yeah. And if God doesn't speak, yeah. our traditions and our codes and our customs, no matter how contemporary or ancient they may be, are all in vain. Yeah. Here is the resolution to this. Here's the resolution, I think. When it comes to you know reintroducing our communities to God, um, our resolution is that everything that we say communicate has to be to the glory of God. It has yeah. to be for the purpose yeah. of informing our communities about this God who cares yeah. and this God who is so interested in establishing a relationship with us yeah. that he initiated the yeah. process yeah. by sending his son, Jesus Christ. And, for, and effectuated and fulfilled the process. And I think that no matter what side you're on, yeah. tradition or non-tradition, yeah. I think that what, what is necessary is to agree that the point and the purpose is to connect people to God. Yeah. And so whether or not you agree with our music whether or not you agree with our style of worship, our heart is to connect you with God. Yeah. And so if you want to be a part of our community and our church and you want to serve faithfully and you want to know God through Jesus Christ, yeah. if those are your aims and you say, how about 
we sing this. Can we sing this on yeah. this day? Can yeah. we sing this? Yeah. Because our heart is for God and our heart is not necessarily to defend our tradition. Yeah. As long, so long as it's it's in order and it's biblical. Yeah. Then we should say, yeah, we can worship God together in that way. And there's a word of encouragement in that mm-hmm. to those of us who gather in half field socially distant churches. Mm-hmm. Is the gospel being preached? Is God being glorified? Mm -hmm. Is the availability of salvation and transformation through Christ being offered? And if that is happening, God is pleased. And I mean, when, when we make that the priority, when we make just this relationship with God, this connection with God the priority, for those who exist, those pre-existing members and those who come into the church, it doesn't matter which side uh, you're on, um, we'll stop having less of these scuffles about traditions and sure. why we do this this way, why we do that that way. Sure. Because the only thing that will matter to us is that relationship to God Absolutely. and seeing others come to God. Yeah. And we will spend so much less time sitting in our pews, you know, rubbing our thumbs together, wondering why so-and-so didn't do this this way or so-and-so didn't do that way. And we'll just be so elated yeah. that God is still moving in our community yeah. Yeah. and souls are still coming to Christ. Yeah. And so I think, you know, that's kind of where we land here in this text when yeah. we think about um, the elders coming to faith and then taking that faith abroad to the nation of Israel. And the people responding with yeah. joy and gladness. The, the, the miracles, and they bow down and worship, the yeah. miracles that Moses performed, the great feats that Moses performed in the presence of those elders yeah. was not to convince those elders um, in, 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 in to believe in Moses' methods. Yeah. It was to convince those elders yeah. in this message that came from God. Yeah. And I think that that, that's, that has to be what is most important to us, yeah, I is, is getting those who do not know God uh, to know him. Yeah. Well, Doc, it's it's we've been going over for over an hour now. Um, got some great feedback, some great questions and input. I wasn't able to put everybody's comments on the screen, but believe you me, um, if you join us again next week and you have additional comments or questions, I would love to be able to talk to you. Thank you so those. much for your comments yeah. and your questions. Certainly. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you, First Baptist. Thank you, Davis Temple. Thank you, Davis Temple. Thank you, everybody who's joining. We uh, we appreciate